Okay, so we left off here we're talking about bomb calorimetry, but what we're going to do today in, in the lab is if you take the bomb out, we have this electric heater here. So we're going to measure the... Um, oh, thanks. Okay, how about that? So we're going to take the bomb out, and then we're going to fill this with a certain amount of water. And, and today we're going to go through the calculations. So pretty much all the calculations for this lab, or at least the concepts, uh, will definitely be covered today. So... Now, this is a really fancy calorimeter that we have here because all of this stuff is locked down inside the door. Ours has got a glass door, and so we can't have things that are bolted to the bottom of the door and so on. Um, and our lid doesn't bolt on. Okay. So, so in terms of calorimetry, if the change in volume is zero, then work is zero. And so the only change in internal energy is the heat. And so if we measure the heat, we're measuring the change in internal energy. So we can... Uh, we can Measure that at constant volume. We can also do that for water because the thermal expansion of water is not very much. I mean, you change the temperature of water a few degrees and it doesn't triple in size like a gas would. You know, water changes very little. So most of the energy change is the heat. There may be a tiny amount of work pushing against the atmosphere, but it would be the small amount of expansion of the water as it heats up, which is not very much at all. Okay. And then we have this... <coughs> change in heat is related to the change in temperature using this calorimeter constant. Now this right here is like the heat capacity for the whole calorimeter, but it, it contains all of the structures. It contains the steel, um, the stirring mechanism, the wall. So all of those things require joules to change their temperature. <clears throat> so we can't just go with the heat capacity of water. Now, my theory is the heat capacity of water is the major component, okay? But we'll see. So part of today's lab is to see how far off the <clears throat> theoretical values are uh, from mixing these two uh, liquids. So we're going to start out with just mixing hot and cold water. So we're going to have cold water in the, in the, um, the door with the thermometer in there, and then we're going to pour in hot water. And it'll, it's really a practice in doing the calculations, trying to keep track of the joules. We'll notice that the temperature should reach the, the weighted average temperature of the two volumes. So like if you had, uh, let's say you had equal volumes of hot and cold water. One was at 100 degrees, uh, let's say 50 degrees C, and the other was at 100 degrees C. Um, we can convert those to Kelvin. But, um, uh, and so they're going to, if they're exactly the same mass, Theoretically, they would reach a temperature halfway between. So if we had, you know, 100 grams of water at 50 C and 100 grams of water at 100 C, they would meet at 75, okay? Because the heat loss from the hot water would go into the cold water, and they both have the same specific heat. So the same joules that changed hands would raise or lower the temperature by the same amount because it's water and water. But the water's in contact with glass. So the doer, even though there's a vacuum between the inner and outer walls, the inner walls are glass. So we've got to raise their temperature up too. And then there is a small amount of joules lost to evaporation. So if the joules don't go into the cold water, but in fact break the bonds of the water and some of those hot molecules leave, we've lost some joules. Okay. So it won't come up to 75, it might come up to 74 or 73. And so you've got that small amount of missing heat okay so that's that's what we're gonna that's one of the calculations we're gonna do today okay um, what I'd like to do with the heater is to have everybody measure a different amount of water so we have different depths in the door the door is a cylinder okay and you've got you're heating the bottom which everybody will be heating the bottom but then the walls if you have a different amount of water you're heating up a different amount of the wall area Okay, and so we'll calculate the calorimeter constant of the, of the glass. We're going to use the, the um, water's heat capacity. We'll put that in so we'll know how much of the energy of our heater went into the water. And we should have a certain uh, calorimeter constant if it's just pure water. It would be close to 4 uh, joules per, uh, per gram of water. But it's going to be like 4.2 or 4.3. It's going to be higher than water because we have to heat up the glass too. And so we'll see, see what we get. We're going to put all our data on a shared spreadsheet, and then you can analyze the whole class's data. Okay. 
you're given the freedom to analyze that any way you want. So you can go in there and if you want to do a linear regression or if you want to, if you're some suspect data points, uh, you know, who knows what someone did. Maybe they had something else in their water or whatever. Um, if you see anything that's just really crazy and way off the line, don't ruin your model. You have the freedom to say, well, this data point is suspect. So I'm going to model the other nine or ten points and leave this one off. Okay. Just justify what you do. Now, if we're using a heater, we just take the current, the voltage times delta T, and we have the joules that comes out. Okay. <clears throat> if we wanted to know what that um, <clears throat> heat capacity is, we could um, we could calculate it this way. So we have the joules on top and the change in temperature on bottom, and so that would be our heat capacity for the whole container. Now, it would be nice to have all of this put together so we have the heater in there with the bomb, with the thermometer, with the stirring stick and everything all going at once. We could run the heater and get the heat capacity for the whole show, <laughs> okay? That would be perfect. Uh, we can't fit all of that into our door, okay? So we can't fit this heater in with the bomb and with the thermometer and the stirring uh, um, impeller or you know the propeller uh, so we can't actually do it that way what we're going to have to do is do a, a bomb sample with a known like benzoic acid and we'll do this next week we'll put benzoic acid in there where we know the the enthalpy of combustion and we'll burn it and we'll get use that heat to calculate the heat capacity for the bomb and the container and everything like that then we'll put our unknown in there, fill it up with this, almost as, exactly the same amount of water. We'll try to get close, okay? And then run our unknown. <clears throat> and then we'll take into account the difference in water, the difference in the amount of wire that was burned and so on, and we'll calculate the enthalpy of combustion of our unknown. Okay. So this is uh, what an example what we call a thermogram looks like. So we let this, this, this is called the pre-period here, where we let the uh, temperature of the system equilibrate. It'll, you put it all together and the thermometer will bounce around and then you see it stop changing. It'll drop by a tenth or a few hundredths of a degree every second. And so you'll see it just kind of drifting down. Why is it typically drop? Well, because of evaporation. So which molecules evaporate? The hot ones. And so if the hot ones leave, the whole system is cooler. Okay. <clears throat> We're typically running the, the stirring propeller at this time. And so it's, you know, it's really bringing everything to thermal equilibrium pretty quickly, but that also um, enhances evaporation too. So those hot molecules find the surface and they have enough energy to leave. Then something happens, some event. Well, in our case, the event it's going to be pouring the hot water in. And so we'll see this jump in temperature. And with next week with the bomb calorimetry, it'll be ignition of the bomb. So you punch the button and it sparks that wire, the wire burns, the sample burns in oxygen, gives off that heat. It heats up the stainless steel vessel, which then is cooled by the water. So the water is what we measure. And the water temperature looks like this. Now, if you look at this, you say, okay, where's Delta T, right? If I were to measure this, temperature here and subtract this temperature here, notice they're diagonal in time. And this may have been drifting down. So actually I should extrapolate this line and measure here. Okay, so that's a vertical jump. So how do we distract, how do we measure the, the t delta T? And so which point do I pick up here? Do we wait till it's stable? How do we define stable? Right, and so this is a real question, and they have a they have scientific working groups to answer these questions. How do we determine what delta T is in a thermogram like this? You notice there's no data point where you can take this clear data point minus that clear data point to get delta T. So they get a committee together as part of the ASTM, the Association of Standards and Technology Measurement. Or I don't know. You have to go look it up. I forget every time. You want to look that up? <laughs> and so. Um, <clears throat> So they get a committee, a working group together, and they come up with a procedure that's unambiguous. It doesn't have to be easy. It just has to be unambiguous. 
Okay, that's the key. And so this is the ASTM analysis. So what they do is they, they make you draw a line with through this data and extend it. And we're going to do this by hand just to show that you can do it by hand um, in your lab. So there's if you look at the lab section of this week's um, Blackboard site, it says print this off and analyze it by hand to show you know the steps. So the first step is to extend the pre-period. The second step is to extrapolate backwards the post period. Okay, so we have a sort of a, a very smoothly changing temperature in the pre period. We wait till the temperature is smooth again in the post period so that we have a trend. And then we use a ruler by hand, use a ruler and, and just uh, draw that line backwards. And then we, we look and we see that when this distance here between these lines is 0.63 of the whole, okay? So if this is one, then this dashed line is 0.63. So 63% of that distance is where we're going to make the, make the decision. You see where this line here, the temperature line is going up and it crosses that dotted line, the 0.63 line? That's where we draw our vertical line, and this is delta T. <clears throat> Does everybody understand the measurement? Like I said, it's it's a it's a standardized way of determining delta T. Okay, so you extend the pre-period, you extend back the post-period. You find what that distance is. Say if you're doing it in centimeters, it's 12 and a half centimeters, okay? So then you take 12 and a half times 0.63, and that'll give you a measurement on your ruler. And you slide your ruler over until the data crosses that measurement. It's like whatever, like 8.7 centimeters or something. You get to 8.7 and you're like, okay, right here, my ruler is going vertical and I'm gonna measure the, the distance between the post period and the pre period lines at the 0.63 rise, okay? And that distance you measure, say in centimeters, then you come over here and see how many centimeters equal a degree, and then you convert that. So if you print this off small, it'll still work. You'll just have uh, a lot of degrees per small centimeter, right? <laughs> if you print it off big, then you'll have a lot of centimeters per degree. And, and so you come up with your own conversion factor with your ruler. So I would measure zero to 60 and I would see what that distance is in centimeters and then I would have my conversion factor. So this might be like 22.3 centimeters is equal to 60 degrees C. And so that's my conversion. Once I measure this distance and it goes from here all the way to here, not just to the 0.63 line. So that's my delta T in centimeters, and then I use my conversion factor to get to, to degrees C. Okay. So that's how you measure a thermogram. Now this is what we're gonna see with our heater. <clears throat> and notice how it's not really a singular event. So this ASTM analysis really doesn't work well for the resistive heater, okay? So for the resistive heater, we've got this linear range here, okay, which is going to be the current I times V, okay, times, uh, let's see, so that's going to be, let's, let's do the slope, sorry. So this slope is going to be a, a certain, uh, delta T over delta little t, okay? So Kelvin or degree C per second. And then from over here in our measurements, we're gonna have the, the current times the voltage is equal to the power. So this is amps times volts is equal to watts which is equal to a joule per second. And so all we need to do is then take this power rating and divide by 
the slope of this line. So you, you get to decide where you want to put the slope. Now so notice how this turns over right here. So we would we would not use this part of the graph. We would not use that part of the graph. We want to get the linear range. And the most accurate slope is going to be the longest linear range. So go ahead and use that full range and get the slope of that line between these two points so that you get a good slope value. And then you measure your current and your voltage for your heater and you have the power rating. And then you can take that C is equal to joules per second over Kelvin per second. And the per seconds cancel and you end up with joules per Kelvin. So we really don't have to do this uh, business for the resistive heater. So we're not gonna use the 0.63 R or the pre-period or post-period for the resistive heater. We're just gonna use that for the hot and cold water and for the bomb calorimetry, okay? So here's the, here's the data that you would get. So I've got this, this is a new, new graph, sorry. <laughs> so this is, again, I've just cut the, the linear part. This is what your data will look like. You know, it's, it's, um, it's pretty linear, okay? I went ahead and did a uh, regression analysis or trend line and I got uh, this 0.1477X. I don't care about the intercept. I just really am looking for this slope, okay? And so this is going to be degrees C per second. I've got the mass of water. I've got the voltage and the, and the current. And so the power is equal to the current times voltage. So I have 300 joules per second going into this, uh, this water. And so then here's my calorimeter constant. 300 joules per second divided by that slope. It gives me joules per Kelvin. So 2031 joules to raise this system uh, one degree. Okay. So let's just think about the specific heat of the fluid. I have 480 grams of water. And so that's going to be, if I just take that ratio, this is how many joules it took to raise the water and the flask um, a degree. So I divide that by the grams, I get 4.23 joules per gram Kelvin. So that's pretty close to the 4.18. If I wanted to convert that to a uh, heat capacity for water, I would multiply by the molar mass. And so here I have 18 grams per mole for water. And so now I have it per mole of water. So 76.2 joules per mole of water. And this is a little bit high because again, it contains the glass of the doer. So it's not just water that we're heating up. Okay. And this will be on the video, so you can go back and check it out. I say that. Let me just triple check. Yeah, it is. Okay. <laughs> so you, you can't imagine how much I scream in my office when I get there and there's no video. <laughs> so anyway. All right. So let's think about the hot and cold water experiment. Okay. So here's our, our toolbox. The specific heat of water at constant pressure is 4.186 joules per gram of water per Kelvin. You might recognize that, I don't know, but you might recognize that as the conversion factor of joules to calories too. Have you all seen that? So if you get what, how many joules are in a calorie, not a kilocalorie, but just a calorie, uh, is 4.186. And, and that should make, maybe clue you in. If we take that and divide that by 4.186 and convert this to calories, we get the specific heat of water of one calorie per gram per Kelvin. You say, well, that's convenient. Well, it's convenient because that's how a calorie is defined. So a calorie is defined as one calorie to raise one gram of water, one degree. So that's that's how much heat it takes to make a calorie. Now, now for, that's not very many calories. So for our food calories and so on, our combustion calories, uh, we use kilocalories, which is calorie with a capital C. So it's really confusing. Calorie lowercase c is is a thousand a thousandth of a kilocalorie which is a calorie with a capital c so who knew right okay so we're going to be putting in the hot water uh, with the mass of hot okay and i kind of drew this little diagram to kind of show that that we have uh this this mass of hot water and it's at this hot temperature here we're mixing them together 
um, we're going to mix it in with this mass of cold water, which is at this cold temperature, and it's going to come to some thermal equilibrium. So here's the first law stated, right? The, the um, you know, the, the uh, energy of an isolated system is, is constant. So we have the system and the surroundings add up to zero. So let's rearrange that. Minus the system equals the surroundings. And the surroundings are the water and the calorimeter parts. Okay, so the the system is the hot the heat in the hot water, and then it's, it's, it's you can do some really interesting things with thermodynamics. It's more like a thought game. We can take all that excess heat out of the hot water and mentally lower that amount of, of hot water temperature down to the cold water temperature. So we kind of have this amount of water. If we take the excess heat out of the hot water, then it's it's at the cold temperature and the mass of uh, cold water is at the cold temperature and then we can throw that heat in as if it's the system's heat and it goes into the total amount of water and raises its temperature up okay and so we have this heat in the system that we're going to throw in there and that's equal to the heat that goes into the the water and the heat that goes into the calorimeter parts okay we can rearrange this because we really we want to know what what amount of heat goes into the calorimeter and then we're going to also know how much temperature change it has so this is what ends up happening notice the 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 temperature here has gone up it like i said we could have just used if we thought of just water only we would have this theoretical temperature which would be that weighted average the, the actual weights of the two waters and their temperatures, we get the weighted average of those temperatures. But it's a little bit less because we had to spend some joules raising up the temperature of the glass. And we have a small amount of evaporation. So here's the heat released from the system. Okay, so this is the, again, we took the temperature difference between the hot and the cold times the mass of the hot water times the specific heat of water. So that's the extra joules we had in that hot water. Notice we don't take it all the way down to absolute zero. We're just taking it down to the cold water temperature because that's the excess heat. That's the amount of excess heat that we put in. Okay. So this is the heat released from the system, the system being the this um, excess heat that we have. We put it all in there and it's like that heat was re released into uh, everything. Okay, the heat captured by the water. Since we pulled the excess heat out, we have this total mass of everything that's at the cold water temperature. And so we're throwing that excess heat into all of it. Does that make sense? We pulled the excess heat out, and we're throwing it into all of the water, not just the cold water. If we threw it into the cold water, the cold water would get hot and the hot water would be at the cold water temperature, but that's not right. So conceptually, you got to think about it. This the whole bath is full of the total amount of water, and so we throw that excess heat into the total amount, and so that's why we use this mass total here. And then we go from the cold temperature up to the actual temperature, not the theoretical, just the actual temperature, times the the um, specific heat of water, and so that's how much heat flowed into the water. And then we can figure out how much goes into the the uh, the the glass of the doer. Okay, and so for that we need to know this piece right here, this this calorimeter constant. Okay, we know it was at the cold water temperature, and now it's at a hot final temperature. And so this one we don't know. We don't know that Q that C cal. Do we know this one? Do we know how much heat flowed into the calorimeter glass? That would be the difference Yeah, we can get it right here. Oh, actually, it's not the difference between natural and theoretical. I mean, you could get it get there from that. Like you could say the water should have come up to here. It came up to there. So the missing jewels went into the glass. So, yes, that's one way to do it. Yeah. 
Uh, we'll probably end up seeing that in the math, actually. But this is where we get that. We, we've calculated this one right here. We've calculated this one right here. And so we use the first law to get that missing joules that went into the glass, okay? And so we just took these two pieces right here and stuck them in for this guy. And so rearranging, we put the temperatures on the other side, so that's why they're in the, in the denominator. We change the sign on the Q system, we change the sign on the, on the Q water, and we end up with this calorimeter constant. So putting all of the math together, this is the joules per Kelvin of the glass and other parts. Like the stirring propeller and the, um, the body of the thermometer, I mean, it's, it's measuring the temperature, but it has some sort of capacitance. You've got to put some heat into the platinum to get it to change its temperature. So those are really small numbers. The glass is probably going to be the largest piece. And then any kind of evaporation based on that area. So when y'all do different experiments and put them all in the same in the in the spreadsheet, what's the only difference between your various analyses? So conceptually, you're going to have different masses of water, so you're going to have different depths. But you're using the same doors, which have the same geometry, which means they have the same area on the top. So evaporation should be about the same. You have to have the same end cap at the bottom, so that glass is the same. The only difference between every one of your experiments is the side depth. So this, the height of the cylinder of water. So the height of that, that cylinder, cylindrical wall of that door is going to be the only difference between your various amounts. Okay. So let's say we get a trend, a, a linear trend in heat capacity uh, for um, this calorimeter constant. That linear trend is just, again, that increasing or decreasing amount of glass that you're heating up along the side. Okay. So that'll help you if you if you do find a trend in the data to explain or under, understand why there would be a small trend in this calorimeter constant. Because if you have more mass, you have more depth. And you might even do, get out your geometry and calculate the walls that are wet by the various masses because you know the volume, you know the density of water. So you can calculate how deep your water is in these doors and so on. You might want to measure the, di the diameter of the door so that you can get some numbers that way. Okay, now let's think about bomb calorimetry. <clears throat> okay, the first law hasn't changed. You know, the this, this system, the heat from the system goes into the surroundings. The surroundings are water and the calorimeter parts. And so all of this stuff is the same. What's different is the experiment itself. So over here, the Q system is the amount of fuel that you have. So the number of moles of fuel times the enthalpy of combustion of that fuel. So the enthalpy of combustion is going to be, again, joules per mole. So then you have number of moles. So you end up with joules released, right? So that's how much heat came out of the system, okay? Where did it go? Well, it had, we have a whole lot more stuff in the calorimeter with the bomb calorimetry. We have the bomb itself, which is a lot of steel, okay? So we gotta raise that temperature up and the water and the cylinder, the glass cylinder of the door, okay? So this calorimeter constant is gonna be completely different than the one you do this week you're doing this one next week, the bomb calorimetry next week. So you can't use the heat, you know, the, the calorimeter constant from this week next week because uh, you don't have as many parts in there. Okay. Okay, so what we what we do here is um, let me erase my marks so that we can see what's going on. Okay. And so the enthalpy of combustion, these are negative numbers, okay? They're exothermic, so don't drop that negative because that tells you your system is negative. That means it released heat, okay? And we're going to use the standard benzoic acid tablet to find this calorimeter constant, okay? So the heat captured by the water is the amount of water. So you measure the mass of water every time you do one of these experiments, 
Okay. <clears throat> you start out with, again, the pre-period cold temperature. This T final is at that T at the point 0.63 rise. So that's that delta T at the point 0.63 rise. So that's your T final, you know, this is that delta T is how you calculate it. So this piece right here is delta T at 0.63 R. And then you have the, the heat capacity of water times the mass of water. So that's how much heat was captured by the water. And then we solve for that calorimeter constant here. So. Now I have you do it by hand just to show that you know how to do the procedure, okay? But I've made a spreadsheet that will do it for you, okay? But it's kind of a complicated spreadsheet because you've got to do a, a, a linear regression and then extrapolate that line forward. And then this is a weird one on the, on the post period, you've got to do a linear regression backwards and extrapolate the line backwards. And so I've got to reverse the data and start at the end and do a linear regression and you get to pick the number of data points because you don't want to pick points where it starts to curve. And so you can add in the number of points that you want to use in your extrapolation. And when your R squared value starts to go to pot, then you back up. Like if I go, if I'm modeling 10 line, 10 data points and I put in an 11th and it's starting to rise, then the R squared is going to start to, to go bad. And so then I back up and just do 10. And, and so you accept the number of data points you want to model and you extrapolate your lines in Excel and then it'll tell you what the delta T is. Now, it, it would get us way off track for me to try to teach you guys how to make that spreadsheet. So I know you think I try to push you pretty far in Excel, but I thought that might be a bridge too far because you would just get pissed off <laughs> and say, I just can't do it. Yeah, and because it, it kind of hurt my brain to make that spreadsheet too. Um, but anyway, if you want the challenge, try to dig around in there and see what I'm doing with that spreadsheet. I think you have enough to understand it once it's built. You can go through and say, okay, I see what he's doing here. Okay, so this is our calorimeter constant. This again would be the, the, the uh, heat it takes to, to heat up all the parts of the calorimeter other than the water. So the water we have in there, so this is the steel bomb, this is the glass of the doer. Okay, and so if we have a good number for this calorimeter constant, then uh, that stuff really doesn't change as long as you're using the same bomb and the same glass doer. So I think that's something to also point out for this lab. So everybody pay attention on this one. When you're doing calorimetry upstairs, we have two calorimeters and we have three bombs. Always use the same equipment. So like if you and your partner are gonna be doing a, a couple of runs and you, you do the benzoic acid tablet in this bomb, okay, you wanna use that same bomb for your unknown. We have an ultrasonic tank to clean the soot out if you don't get a complete burn. It'll produce a really sooty uh, burn, so we can put it in the, the ultrasonic tank. Don't put the bomb in the ultrasonic tank and then do another run with a different bomb. Because you just calculated the calorimeter constant for the bomb that you're cleaning, and now you're using one that's different. Okay, so uh, that's, that's a source of really being off if you use a different bomb. Okay, now when this uh, calorimetry, when the um, when you're using your unknown, so the surroundings are the water and the calorimeter parts, and now we know the K, the the, the uh, calorimeter constant, and so we want to know how much heat was released by our unknown. So now the unknown is inside the system. So we measure our total mass of water that we put in. We measure that delta T at 0.63 R for the new run, okay. We've just measured this with the benzoic acid and we're using the same bomb and the same calorimeter. So this constant is a constant for those pieces of equipment. And now we can get the heat from that system. And so if we have the heat, sorry, let me go back. If we have the heat for that system, we have the joules of combustion. Okay, so that's the amount of joules for combustion. But how much did we put in there? So let's say you put in a you know point point 
one gram or 0.2 grams of Crisco, which is one of our things, animal fat, you know. So we put that in there. Well, then you've got the joules it takes to burn 0.1 gram. So then you can calculate the joules of combustion per gram of fat. And this is actually what they have as far as nutritional values on the back of packaging and so on. The amount of calories for fat, the amount of calories per protein, amount of calories per carbohydrates. And so you should get pretty close to, if you do Crisco, the calories per fat. Uh, you want to convert this from joules to calories. It's kilocalories because it's a capital C. And then you should, should be able to hit that number on the package. So that's pretty cool. So this is some practice calculations. Um, so if we've got 10 amps times in a 12 volt power supply for 300 seconds, then we end up with uh, 36 kilojoules. So we're doing that kind of thing with our heater. What's the calorimeter constant if this caused a 3.6 rise in temperature? Of sort of the gross calorimeter constant, or including water and all the parts, this would be 10.4 joules per Kelvin or joules per degree. Since we're using delta Ts, we could use Celsius or Kelvin because they have the same temperature uh, division unit in terms of joules. And then how many amps does a 1200 watt hairdryer pull? Just so you know, right? That's 10 amps. So you're pulling a lot of current out of the wall if you've got a 1200. Now I think they make a, what they make, 1500? What hair dryers? I don't know. I don't. I don't use them. So <laughs> I just scrub three times and it's dry. <laughs> All right. So we're pretty well done. The rest is just some again some background information. So I think it's going to be a great lab. Hopefully, you enjoy it.